you have a, your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. And we are continuing to just work our way through uh, the Gospel of Mark. So our series is what you would call an expositional series. The paragraph breakdown in Mark decides what we move on to next uh, for the most part. And thereby the, the Holy Spirit selects the, the topics that we have. I was really struck this morning as we were uh, singing together, uh, how many of the themes that we're singing will really be noted in this text. And you will, just as I even read it without uh, comment, if you, if you can remember what you just sang, you will notice them uh, very, very prominently in this passage. And I will uh, maybe remind you of one or two of them later as we move through the uh, message together. So let's stand together. Um, Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And on that day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with them in the boat, just as he was, uh, he took with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. Now you'll notice that that doesn't come back into the story at all, the other boats. Uh, so why mention the other boats? Well, this is a, an indication the scholars point out that this is probably a story that Mark got directly from Peter. An eyewitness, and Peter was there, and Peter simply mentions there were other boats. Uh, he just mentions it in passing. And so Mark mentions it in passing, certainly indicating that what you're about to hear is very, very likely uh, Peter's eyewitness account of what happened in this sea crossing. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he, that is Jesus, was in the stern, asleep, on a cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Or not yet do you have faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is our joy this morning to be among those who have come to worship you. As the psalmist says, I rejoice with those who are saying to me, let us come to the house of the Lord. Let our feet among, be among those standing in the gates of your people. This body of people that's built like a city in the book of Revelation, you describe us as a, a new Jerusalem, this group of people that make up your eternal people, all built up in faith together. Father, it is by your decree 
that we come to own such privileges that we give thanks to you. Thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus for all that you have done for us. And Lord, on this day in which we reminded ourselves of the challenges faced by the children among us, we do pray for all of our kids who are here this morning, who will be in this, many in the Sunday school hour, in the next hour, that the word of truth would go forth unto them, speak to them, work in them. Pray the same for us who are older, that the word of truth would go out and be among us and that we would be aware of such things that there is a judgment coming in the end and that we would be among those who ask that we would be found at peace with you on that judgment day, that we would find ourselves quiet and confident in your presence because we are among those who love you. The great promise that all things work together for good only applies to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. Lord, may that be us. May we be among those who find the peace of Christ within the church of Christ. May we be among those who find the quietness of heart among the people of God. May we be those who know you, who rest in you, who have learned from you. Father, come and enable us to hear your voice in such a way that we will turn our eyes afresh and consider who you are and how you are relating to us as we make our journey across this life with you. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. One of the central questions that sort of insists on being asked in Mark's account here in Mark 4, 35 to 41, is who are they being asked to trust and who are they being chided for not trusting in this passage? Is it God the Father? Is it God the Son? Is it a combination of both? Uh, they are definitely being chided here. Uh, that's a, it's a pointed question in verse 40, where he says to them, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith, or not yet, not yet? Are you having faith? Walking around with me quite a length of time now? Why are you so afraid? And it's a story about how they got so afraid while making a trip to the other side, how they're failing to trust the Father and they're failing to trust the Son as they make their way across to the other side. One of the commentators says that the answer of Mark in this story is mirrored really, really nicely by Jesus saying the same thing to his disciples in John 14, verses 1 to 3. 
Themes are the same, fearfulness, they're deathly afraid. In John 14, let not your heart be troubled. But then very explicitly, John says, believe in God, and Jesus is doing the talking, believe also in me. Believe in the Father, believe in the Son. It's the same combination that shows up in this text, the the trust in the Father and the Son just sort of meld together. Trust in the triune God, but trust in the person of the Father. Trust in the person of the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let not your heart be troubled, but you're, you tend to be troubled. And the solution to that trouble, to that fear, is faith. Believe in God. Believe also in me. They're learning to trust God in our story while well, they take this sea voyage across the Sea of Galilee. We're learning to trust God as we take a voyage across life. And what we're headed for as Terry mentioned last week in his message, what we're headed for is a place that Christ has prepared, the end of the age. In other words, we're traveling across the present age, waiting to arrive at what theologians call the eschatological age, the end of the age, the new heaven and the new earth, the eternal state after judgment. But after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, our wrestling with our own death is assumed and it works its way in here, but it's, it's almost never the focus in the New Testament. The focus is the age to come. I go to prepare a place for you. And we're journeying toward that place. And when he comes, he will receive us unto himself that where he is, there we may be also. State our thesis for this morning this way. We need to realize who Jesus is while traveling with him to the other side. And that's pretty indistinguishable from we need to realize who God is while traveling with him to the other side. The opening, the opening line that we sang together this morning was about the presence of God. He's here. He's here. He's here every day. Every day of our lives. He's here. We move across life in the presence of God. They move across the sea with the Son of God in the boat with them. That's the story beginning in verse 35. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Four angles into this story. The first one I've 
expressed this way. Disciples travel with Jesus to the other side. Disciples travel with Jesus to the other side. On that day, when the evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. There it is. Let us go across to the other side. They're traveling to the other side, first-hand account of Peter, eyewitness to the things that we are reading about here, uh, evidence is that Mark would have heard this directly from Peter. That's how, as we mentioned, he knows about the fact that there was other boats when they left. It has nothing to do uh, with the story, but central to the story is, is they're moving to the other side, journeying, taking a trip. Literally, that's happening. But the story certainly reaches beyond one trip across the Sea of Galilee. It's one of the central metaphors, right, in the Bible, is that we travel across life with God. Some of the most stirring language, right, from the opening chapters of the Bible. For instance, when you get to Genesis chapter 5, and you're just getting started in your trek through the Bible, you read about this whole group of people who are born and they die, and they're born and they die, and they're born and they die. And then, and then you get down to verse 21 of Genesis 5 and read this. And when Enoch was 65 years old, he fathered Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God. And Enoch walked with God. In case we missed it the first time, after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, he had other sons and daughters, and thus the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God. It's like a sandwich. There it is again. Enoch walked through his life with God. And then it doesn't say, like it says of everyone else in the chapter, and he died. But this mysterious language, and he was not. Because God took him. But the striking language is the real, simple, everyday language of taking a walk. And Enoch walked with God. Now it fits that chapter, right? Because at the center of our story, what drives all the key theological maneuverings in our story is a close encounter with death that the disciples are convinced they are having in the middle of the Sea of Galilee as they make their way toward the other side. Back to the parallels with John 14, they're frightened. And as in John 14, the essence of Jesus' message is, don't be frightened, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Heading for, in this case, in John 14, the eschatological other side, the end of the age, the new heavens and the new earth, everlasting hope. We're on our way, we're trying to get there. It's a dangerous trip. Lots of fearful stuff happens along the way. And Jesus is telling, don't be troubled. Here's what you do. You believe in God, you believe also in me. Now, as I mentioned, at, at the heart of this, what drives the major exchanges between Jesus and the disciples is the close encounter with death. Sometimes we who are in church regularly, I think we forget that people really go out of their way not to think seriously about death in our culture. And our culture is very helpful to that. They're never asked to think seriously about their own death. Um, and for good reason, right? Because the, the cultural leaders, the great thinkers of our day have absolutely nothing to say that'll stand any ground in the face of death. And so they wisely usually say nothing and avoid 
the topic like the plague because they're helpless and struck dumb to say anything semi-intelligent in the face of it. I was really struck by this very recently, just reading the biography of the social literary critic Susan Sontag. Now, Susan Sontag, you may, you may recognize the name vaguely or not, but she was, for the last third of the 20th century, one of the most sophisticated cultural voices in America, centered in New York City and moved in the absolutely highest intellectual, cultural, literary circles that exist in American life. She had contracted stage four breast cancer at the age of 42, which that was 1975 when she was 42. And at that time, stage four breast cancer was like a 99% chance that you are not going to last the year. But she lasted the year. She lasted the year. And she didn't die until she was 71 in 2004. She did die of leukemia. And she had battled various forms of cancer all the way through. Uh, but the biographer says this about Susan Sontag and, and how she thought about death. He writes, as she got older, and manage time and again to beat the odds, she started to hope that in her case, the body's rules would be waived. That she just wouldn't die. You think, oh, come on. One of the most sophisticated minds in New York just tells herself, maybe, maybe, just maybe, I won't ever die. You say, well, that's crazy. Well, actually, that's how frightened of death we are. That's how lost in the, in the face of death the secular mindset is. Marxism has nothing to say in the face of death. Nothing comforting, nothing hopeful, nothing reassuring, nothing establishing, nothing. And here she is, a cultural Marxist. The top of her field, at the top of her game, just maybe she'll never die. Secondly, disciples experience trouble while traveling with Jesus. Disciples experience trouble while traveling with Jesus. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. Just how serious it is is found Verse later in verse 38, where they say to Jesus, we're perishing. We're perishing. Rodney Decker translated this way, we're dying. We're dying. That's their word as they wake Jesus up. We're dying. We're perishing. Can this happen to people while they're traveling with Jesus? Storms rise into the lives of his elect, lives of his children. Same kind of storms that run into the life of a Susan Sontag. Do they run into the lives of the most sanctified people walking about among the people of God? They certainly do. They certainly do. And they come, as he says, Suddenly, 
They're on what's supposed to be this simple trip, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat. And the boat was already filling with water, and they're perishing. Some of you will maybe even know this family, relatively local, and we have connections through school down to Orange City. But a friend of mine just three weeks ago, he was doing a, two and a half weeks ago, doing a funeral for a family at his church, and the, the son, the oldest child, had just died at the age of 22. He had been battling a brain tumor for three and a half years, and, and now he's died. And they're having this funeral for him. And they're singing worship songs as the funeral begins. And sitting in the front row is this young man's dad and his mother and his 20-year-old sister. And during one of those early songs, the mother falls over with a massive heart attack. Within seconds, the medical people that are in the congregation that day, are, they've rushed forward and there's four or five, mixture, mixture of four, five, six doctors and nurses working around this woman and they can't get her restarted and they eventually retreat to the hospital and so they get someone there and she's taken up and hauled away, but she never revived. She never revived. And now they reschedule a double funeral about a week later. And now the husband and father sitting in the front row at the funeral of his wife and son, a daughter sitting at the funeral of her mother and her brother. And there they are. That's a storm. That's a storm. That's trouble. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, and the boat was filling with water. And they're, they're traveling with Jesus. They're traveling with Jesus. They really are. And still, Thirdly, disciples will be tempted to wonder if Jesus cares during parts of the trip. This story occurs in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. So Matthew has a version of this, and Luke has a version of this, and we're, of course, in Mark's version of this. Mark's is by far the most punchy of the three. Um, Matthew, Matthew records the encounter between the frightened disciples and Jesus this way. Save us, Lord, we're perishing. Luke describes it this way. Master, Master, we are perishing. Mark, you'll notice, throws a completely different angle into it the angle that we all instantly experience when it's us, our question, the question. Teacher, do you not care? Do you not care? Because the question is, if you cared, how could this be happening? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? See, they have interpreted Jesus' ability to sleep in the storm 
as a lack of concern. Here you are, sound asleep. Don't you care? Don't you care? Fast forward, and he adds, Jesus adds injury to insult, right? You can just imagine how you respond, how I respond, how anybody responds. Under circumstances like this, when Jesus says, why are you so afraid? <laughs> what a question! Why am I afraid? Because the boat's filling with water, and it's pitch dark, and we're about to drown. There. There. Good night. What a question. Why are you so afraid? But that's what he says. Why are you so afraid? Why are you cowardly? Why are you fearful? And they, and they assume he doesn't care. Teacher, do you not care? Why do they think that? Well, it's because they don't know Jesus as well as they think they do. They don't know God as well as they assume they do. Very true of all of us. We're all about knowing God, but it's one thing to know him, right? On a sunny afternoon when the sea of your life is calm and you're floating around fishing. It's another thing, it's another thing to know him when you're in a storm in the pitch dark in the middle of the night and your boat is filling with water and you're an experienced fisherman and you know there's no way any of us survive this. Nobody swims to shore in this. We're dead. We wouldn't even know what direction to swim. Couldn't get there if we did. They don't trust God as they should. Do you not care that we are perishing? Remember the eyewitness account, probably for Peter. Eyewitness account. I suspect that Peter has a story like this and what Jesus said in the back of his mind. When he writes what he writes quite a bit later, 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. He uses this exact verb that Jesus uses here in Mark 4. Peter uses it in verse 7 of 1 Peter 5. But let me read into it from verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. See, if you've read the Bible, if you've paid attention, you know this about God. He can send a storm into your life at any moment without explanation, without apology. He does it all the time. He does it all the time. You know that. Why? Because you've paid attention. You've, you've read the Bible. You've watched the experience of believers all around you all your life. You know that. Theoretically. Theoretically. But when it's you, no small thing, no easy task to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. God's doing this. And he can still be trusted. God's doing this. So there's no need for me to panic. Because he's here. They've got Jesus right in the boat. He's here. He's here.
Peter then goes on. He says, cast all your anxieties on him because, you could translate it this way, it is a care to him concerning you. Most of uh, all the English translations just smooth it out and leave a, a one word untranslated. They just say, he cares for you. He cares for you. But if you would, if you would translate it somewhat literally, it would read, as I've said, told you a hundred times, it reads like this. It matters to him concerning you. It matters to the living God concerning you. That's why you shouldn't be panicky when you've got trouble. Because you know this. God cares. It matters to the living God. It matters to God concerning me. So why am I so afraid? Well, Peter, Peter tells us, or Jesus tells us through Peter. With the second question, don't you have any faith yet? Do you not have any faith yet? Not yet do you have faith? Fourth, disciples need to come to understand who they are traveling with, right? So this is where the dual, you know, the dual piece, right, about our, as we sang them this morning, right? We opened the first line about the presence of God. Later, another song about just how magnificent Christ is. Was that who you traveled with in life? If you're a believer, yeah, that is actually who you are traveling with, who we were singing about this morning. Those exalted tones deserves all of that and more than we can express. And disciples eventually come to realize that. And, and they, you, you find them in verse 41. They're finally coming back to the question, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is this? Because in verse 39, he had awoken and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. Now notice what they don't say. They don't say, you know, Jesus says, peace be still, everything calms down. And, and they don't say what we in our casual way would imagine, right? Cool. That was really cool. Man, Jesus, that's really cool, that stuff you do. Whoa, man. Really cool. Thanks a lot. Yeah. We should have woke you a little earlier, I guess. I don't know. But uh, that was really cool. That whole speaking stuff, that was really cool. No, no, they're, they're afraid. They're afraid. They were filled with great fear. Why are they so afraid? Oh, because they've read the Psalms. They've read the Psalms. If you've read the Psalms, you thought of this story a lot of times in your life. If you regularly read the Psalms, you've thought of this story. Especially as relates to the psalm that the worship team read, Psalm 107. That one really parallels out. But that's not the only one, right? So Psalm 65. Psalm 65. Um, verse 6 and 7. The one who by his strength established the mountains being girded with might, who stills the roaring seas... The roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Now, the one who does that in Psalm 65 is the God of our salvation. The God of our salvation. Closer to Psalm 107 is Psalm 89, 9. You rule the raging of the seas, and when the waves rise, you still them. You still them. You rule over the waging of the sea. And when the waves arrive, you still them. 
Now, the one who does that is Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. God. God in both places. God's the one who stills the seas. God's the one. And now, very parallel to how Mark tells us the story, Psalm 107, beginning in verse 25. And he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea, and they mounted up to heaven, and they went down to the depths, and their courage melted, and their evil plight, and they reeled and staggered like drunken men, and were at their wit's end. Now, to me, that's, a, that's, a, that's, not, that's a lousy translation, that last little phrase. Because what the Hebrew says is just much more punchy than that. And much more helpful to think about what we actually experience. I mean, wit's end, that's okay, I guess. But what the Hebrew text says, and all of their wisdom was swallowed down. All of their wisdom was swallowed down. That is, we, in, in, in calm weather, we got quite a bit of wisdom. In a storm, <laughs> somebody comes along and swallows all our wisdom. And suddenly we're as panicked as anybody else, as hopeless as anybody else. We shouldn't be, but we are. Why? Because somebody's, something's come along and swallowed all of our wisdom down. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from distress. And he made the storm to be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad that the waters were quiet. And he brought them to the desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Who is this? They say. And they have this. Is this God? Are we traveling across the sea with Yahweh, with God incarnate? They're afraid. Who is this that does what God does and no one else? Who is this? Do you know who it is? That's who we get to travel with. When the storms of life come, and they will, they will. The knowledge that really matters, we talk about knowing God and making him known. Yeah, but be careful. You got to have the kind of knowledge that's not swallowed down in the waves kind of knowledge that remembers who's in the boat with you no matter what's happening. And the stories of the Bible tell us there's no real, there's no easy way. There's no easy way to hang on to that. But that's what you're after. That's what you're after. To know God like that. To know Christ like that. To be able to remain as calm as Jesus as he lay sleeping in the stern of the boat in the storm. Because he knows, he knows like we ought to know. Like we might know. He knows who's in the boat with him. And we need to know, really know. Who's in the boat with us as we make our way?
toward this eschatological haven at the end of the age where we're all headed. And we have to pass through personal death to get there. But Jesus says to us, don't let that trouble you. Let not your heart be troubled. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians 5, well, death. To be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. The day I die, I believe I'll be in paradise with Jesus. Death's got no sting with me because I know the Lord of all the earth and I walk with his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, enable us to hear your voice, to know your voice, to trust you, to turn to you, to rest in you. Teach us the gift, the power of remaining calm in the storms of life because we have really come to know and rest our hope in you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in his name we pray, amen.